welcome to my study. Um, we're going to spend a bit of time here together um, as this is the first official desk lecture for uh, Fundamentals of Contract Law. Sorry, I was trying to remember the course code off the top of my head, but then I thought, well, what's the value of the course code to any of us right now? So what these desk lectures will do is supplement the materials. Some of them have already been recorded. Uh, some of them have been, um, I'll be recording as the semester progresses. Um, they grow each semester depending on how uh, we work together. So um, let's get stuck into it. This first one, I want to talk about the McRobinson case, referred to in your uh, casebook as a ticket case. Um, and it's the first of many that we'll be dealing with over the course of the semester, uh, where we look at where there is a ticket, particularly if there are tickets with terms and conditions on them, um, to work out uh, what the terms and conditions of a contract are, but also to work out whether or not those terms and conditions on the printed ticket form part of the contract or not. So the point here is it effectively, once we have the DNA of the contract, to use the terminology that I've adopted. Once we actually have an offer, capable acceptance on its own terms, which is then accepted without any variation, we have an agreement. So everything that comprises the contract, including the terms and conditions, identifying consideration, ensuring that there's certainty, expressing intention, all need to be wound up in the offer which is one of the reasons we spend so much time talking about offer. So with a ticket, uh, often they have terms and conditions on them. So the question becomes, were they presented before or after the agreement was made? And so McRobinson is the first of those cases. And effectively, we're going to be doing this, identifying when a contract has been made or formed for the purpose of determining whether or not those terms and conditions that are on a ticket form part of that contract or not. So the case uh, is a 1975 case and it relates to McRobinson, which was a travel agent and an air line and the Commissioner of State Taxation in Western Australia. Um, basically the case that you're looking at is an appeal from the Supreme Court of Western Australia uh, to the High Court. Uh, so it has binding authority in each of the jurisdictions that we're working in. Um, so basically the facts go like this. Um, when you're buying a ticket from McRobinson, uh, what you do is you inform them, whether that's the airline directly or the travel agency, of your requirements as a passenger. The next thing that will happen is that McRobinson will advise you whether there were available flights and what it would cost to fly on that day. All pretty simple, yeah? Um, at that point, the passenger gets to select the flight that they want to go on uh, and they pay the chosen fare. Um, they then get a ticket. On the ticket, there are some terms and conditions. In this particular case, there was an exemption clause, sometimes also called a limiting clause, and we'll spend a bit of time talking about these towards the end of the semester. Um, and so it was on the back of the ticket. So the question became, whether or not that term formed part of the contract or not. And in order to work that out, we needed to work out when and potentially where uh, the contract was made. So the next step in the, the factual scenario is that at the time that it was stipulated on the ticket, the passenger would present the ticket at the airport to secure the flight. So the question actually came to, in part, where and when the ticket was made, not just because of the exemption clause, uh, but because um, the place that the ticket is, um, sorry, the place that the contract is made is the place that can charge taxes in relation to the contract itself. So the tax in question is called stamp duty. It's called stamp duty because it is literally stamped, payment of the duty is stamped onto the document. Um, uh, this is a 1975 case, so the example that I have put on the screen here is clearly significantly older than that. Australia went to um, decimal currency in 1966. 
but it's just to give you an example of the old-fashioned way they literally looked like stamps subsequently they might be stamped you know like with an ink stamp these days the document itself is put through like a barcode reader and a print a, a printing is actually affixed to the document itself so for stamp duty purposes, the High Court needed to determine whether the ticket were, that was issued was an agreement or a memorandum of agreement. And because if the ticket itself was the contract, then stamp duty would need to apply to that contract. So the ticket itself also contained a condition that gave the airline the right to cancel the flight or to cancel a booking without any liability. So that was the exception clause. So Mac Robinson or the airline argued that by tendering the ticket, they were making a written offer to the passenger. By retaining the ticket without objecting and paying the fare, the passenger would accept the offer by their conduct. In any event, there wasn't any contract, they said, because the consideration was illusory. There was no consideration. Um, effectively, they said that their whole disclaimer was so broad that Ultimately, they didn't need to uh, uh, carry the, pis uh, the passenger at all. And we'll talk about illusory consideration when we get to it uh, in a couple of weeks' time. The Commission of Estate Taxes, on the other hand, argued that the offer and the acceptance in the case of a purchase of an airline are extricably, 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 sorry about that, extricably mixed up. Uh, that this is a case where rather than have a clear offer or an acceptance, we have a meeting of the minds, we have agreement. The ticket, they said, the document itself was the agreement because it gave rise to an obligation to carry the passenger. And even though it had a very broad exemption clause, which in turn could absolve the airline from the obligation to carry the passenger or frustrate the passenger's hopes of getting to where they wanted to go, they said it wasn't so broad as to be illusory. So there were a number of issues that were going together in this case. And you'll see that there are three different judgments that are worth considering. We end up with a unanimous decision, but interestingly enough, the three judges get to those, uh, that decision in different ways. Ultimately, this case is authority for the proposition that a ticket itself didn't record terms of the agreement rather than the terms of the offer were subsequently accepted by conduct in part as a consequence of the nature of the ticket itself. So why do we look at this case? Um, it, you're, it's the first of many ticket cases that you're going to deal with over the course of this subject. Um, and it's a really good illustration of how difficult it can be to apply a simple doctrine of offer on one hand and matching it with an acceptance on the other. Uh, in fact, in the case, uh, it's referred to as the difficulty of dealing with the doctrine, quote, outside the realms of commerce and conveyancing to the everyday contractual situations, which are a feature of life in modern urban communities. Uh, just as Stephen noted, that uh, the opportunity to negotiate the terms of the contract and any attempt to negotiate would, in any event, usually be pointless since the carrier or the airline was willing only to contract on the terms set out in the ticket. Yet even so, the ticket itself was an invitation and not an offer as drafted.